good sometimes just to stop and think why we do certain things or feel certain ways. So I would ask you, when you worry about money, why do you worry? Why, what makes you worry about money? Or you may be young enough so that you don't particularly worry about money. Well, I'd ask you, why do you worry about what people think of you? When you're all concerned because somebody has criticized you, why do you get all concerned about those things? Probably many of us would say, well, if you don't have money, you can't buy food and you can't buy clothes, so you'll starve and you'll freeze and you'll die. And if you don't have friends who like you, you'll be lonely and you may as well be dead. And yet, that's kind of the bottom line for most of us, isn't it? Yeah. Most of us don't actually live on that bottom line, though it is interesting, isn't it, how many of us live with the fear that sometime we'll fall through the bottom of the bottom line. Even though we don't live there, it's amazing how that fear nags away at the back somewhere. But most of us live a little above that. And we would answer, well, I, I worry about money and I worry about friends because really happiness depends to some extent on the money that you have and on the friends you have. And in fact, in this present life, the more you have of both money and friends, usually the happier you are. And yet, wouldn't you agree that if God really loves you, he will make sure you'll have enough money and friends? And so your happiness depends on his love, doesn't it, rather than on those secondary gifts of money and friends? And probably you would say, as I would, well, sure, I, yes, I, philosophically and ideally, I, I believe that. I, I believe that God does really love me and that he will provide me with enough money and friends, and I sure try to live like that. I really do. But uh, I'll tell you, I find it difficult. When the bank balance begins to go close to zero, I find that I get tense and anxious and worried. And it's the same when somebody criticizes me or I hear that somebody doesn't like me. I try in those crises to trust that God will ensure that I have all the money and friends I need, but it's very difficult. I find that there's something in my nature that really depends on those, what you call those secondary gifts. And I know I should depend on God himself alone, and I should relax and trust him to provide all the money and friends I need, but I find my nature somehow doesn't respond that way. But I think many of us would say that, wouldn't we? Many of us live right there. We would say, yes, we know that we should depend on God to provide these things, but we don't live there. That's not where we live. We, I'm afraid, tend to live depending on the things themselves. It is kind of ironic, isn't it? Because any rational mind finds it fairly easy to believe that we were all made by a personal, intelligent being. And our rational minds 
tend towards believing that he knows why he put us here and that he has so arranged the economy of his world that if we do what he wants us to do, we'll probably have enough food, shelter, and clothing to see our lives through. And yet, somehow or other, we have developed personalities that don't respond to those realities. Isn't that right? So even though we see the, the reason of it and the logic of it, we have somehow developed personalities that don't live in that reality. We have developed personalities that scramble and scrounge fretfully with the other three and a half billion people to grab as much money and as many friends as we can, as if they're just going out of style tomorrow. And it's hard to know why we do it, but we do it. And of course, faced with this paradox, the religions of the world tell us we should be different, and we know we should be different. We know we shouldn't be so enslaved to those things. We know we should be relaxing and depending on our loving Father, but we can't. And some Christian teachers have told us, well, God will forgive you even if you're not different. And yet what we're crying out for is, well, how can we get personalities that respond to those realities? How can we be changed so that we can relax and trust God for the money and friends that we may need? How can we be changed? And of course, the, the last time that our forefathers scrambled and scrounged fretfully to get all the money and friends that they needed, well, God had only one alternative. Because, of course, that just produces wild violence. And maybe you'd like to look at the alternative. It was, it was in our primeval history, uh, back uh, described at the beginning of Genesis, you know, and it's Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6. And it's verses 5 through 7 describes the historical event. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground, man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air for I am sorry that I have made them. And that's what God did with the universal flood. It was the only thing he could see to do, to start all over again. But even that universal flood was just a symbolic expression that God produced in our history to indicate the final solution that he had found to the problem. And the final solution, of course, was that that was set forth in his son's death in 29 AD of our era. And here was the final solution. God foresaw what you would be like. He foresaw that you would refuse to trust him for all that you needed. And he foresaw that you would develop a twisted personality that was enslaved to money and friends for your happiness. And he saw that this twisted personality would never again be able to trust him. And so he took the mental and emotional and physical equipment of that old personality of yours that was twisted in that way, and he transplanted it into his son Jesus and he destroyed it there. And then when Jesus rose from the dead, it was really only a physical resurrection that expressed a mastery over death and the forces of evil that took place in eternity. But when Jesus rose from the dead, God recreated you with a new personality. 
that is free to relax and to trust God as Jesus himself does at this moment. Now, that's what God has done, loved ones. And you can be changed this morning because that is reality, that there is available to you a new personality that has been made by God and recreated by him and his son in a supraspatial miracle. And that personality is filled with the intimacy and trust that Jesus has in his Father, and that can be exercised by you. Now, how do you actualize that cosmic reality in your life here this morning? How do you make that real in yourself, in your own day-to-day -day life today? Well, actually, it's all very commonsensical. The same way you enter into all the other realities that surround your life. That's it. There are just two responses that you and I have to make in order to experience that cosmic reality. One is be willing to live in it. Would you be willing to live in that reality of that old money, friend, dependent personality being destroyed and having a new clean personality that is able to trust and relax God for all that you need? Would you be willing to live in that reality? That's the first step. Do you know that uh, E equals MC squared? And you say, well, yeah, sure, if you say it, I believe old Einstein's energy equation, ah, I believe E equals MC squared, sure. It's no big deal to say you believe that. Sure it isn't. Because it's not going to have an immediate effect on your life at this moment. So it's easy to give intellectual assent to it. Now, that isn't the first step that's necessary to enter into the cosmic reality of being raised with Jesus and being changed. The essential first step is to be willing to live in that reality. That you don't have to do with a purely academic belief like E equals MC squared. But do you know the air in this auditorium is poisoned? Do you know that? <gasps> and, well, that's different. I mean, you don't just casually say, sure, I believe it. No, because you know if you believe that, then it'll affect your life. You'll immediately have to stop breathing or decide to breathe and risk it. But it's a matter of your will as well as your mind. Now, that's the first step, loved ones, and experience the deliverance that God has wrought for you in Jesus. The first step is, would you be willing to live in that reality? That's what belief is when Jesus talks about belief, you see. It's are you willing to be in accordance with the thing that you believe? And so you say, yes, I do believe that this old money, friend, dependent personality was destroyed in Jesus, and I was raised up in him, and now I can feel the same way towards his father as he does. The issue is not, do you simply believe that in your head, but are you willing to live in the reality of that? In other words, belief in Jesus' language has always a volitional content, not just an intellectual content. Volitional is willing. It is always a matter of the will. Now, would you look at the verse, loved ones, that we're studying today so that you're aware of where that occurs? It's Romans 10 and verse 9. Romans 10 and verse 9. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, you see, that's the phrase. 
believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's not just believe it as an intellectual concept, but are you willing to believe in your heart and therefore to be Lefan, to be in accordance with that belief? Are you willing to be raised with Jesus from the dead? That's really it. Are you willing to live in that reality? I mean, many of us here believe that cigarette smoking causes cancer. Many of us here believe that eating beef clogs up the old arteries. Many of us here believe that exercise enables the heart to last longer, but we don't live in the light of those realities. We don't. And we're not willing to live in the light of those realities. So we never receive the benefits of those realities in our own lives. Now, do you see that in order to experience the benefit of any reality, be it breathing clean air, or be it exercising so that the heart lasts longer, you need to be willing to live in the reality itself. In other words, are you willing to live in the state that Jesus is in at this moment at God's right hand? That's what you have to face. Are you willing to live as he lives, satisfied with only God's approval? and with only God's love. I think a lot of us, you see, tend to say, sure, sure, because we like the positive aspect of that. But do you see that the negative aspect of that is, are you willing to live apart from peer approval? Because it's either one or the other. Are you willing to live apart from peer recognition? And then do you see that that means, are you willing to live with peer criticism? Are you willing to live even if your friends put you down or tear you apart? Now, that's what it means, loved ones, to be willing to live in the reality of your place in Jesus at God's right hand. And if you're not willing to live in the reality, then you'll never experience the benefits of that reality. You see, it's the same with the money and the clothes and your ambition and your future. It's all the other things, you see. Are you willing to live in Jesus and to be satisfied with what he's satisfied with? Now, the moment you are live, willing to live in that reality, there will burst upon you the love of God, and you'll begin to sense his love. Now, the second step is live in that reality. The first step is real belief, a real willingness to live in that reality. The second step is action, live in that reality. Now, you'll find that, loved ones, in the other part of that Romans 10 and verse 9. Paul reversed them, but he, you'll find in the next verse he puts them in the order we're taking them now. But the second step is what he mentions first in Romans 10 and 9a. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and the word confess is homologio, and it means say the same as God. It means make your life and your lips and your behavior and your actions match the reality. Do you believe in the banaka blast? <laughs> if you take a shot in the mouth, your breath will smell sweet and fresh, right? And so you, of course, you believe it. And how do you experience the reality of it? Well, I asked you first, are you willing to live in the reality of it? And you think of the sweetness and freshness of the breath, and sure, yeah. But are you willing to live in the negative aspects too? Are you willing to bear the bitterness of the taste when it first hits the back of your throat? So are you willing to live in the reality of it? And you say, yeah, yeah, sure I am. Yeah, now I believe that it'll give me sweet, fresh breath, and I'm willing to live in the reality of it. No, my breath doesn't smell sweet. 
And I say to you, yes, but you have to act in the light of that reality. You have to act. You have to actually take the shot in the mouth. And you say, mm, no, I want to smell my breath fresh and sweet without taking the shot in the mouth. And it's impossible. It doesn't matter how willing you are to have fresh, sweet breath. It doesn't matter how much you believe it until you actually, oh. <laughs> until you actually do it, you'll never be overcome by fragrance. <laughs> you'll never be able to kiss your wife. <laughs> but do you see the difference, loved ones? You can believe, you can be willing, but unless you act on that reality, the reality will not begin to be made real in your life. So the Red Sea was rearranged. The forces that held the Red Sea in its place, those forces were rearranged in Jesus' pre-creation death. The forces were all rearranged so that the sea could be split at any moment. But all of that reality could only be actualized in this world when Moses took his rod and stretched it out across the sea. Unless you act on the basis of the reality, the reality will never be made real in you. And it was so with the beggar that was at the gate beautiful of the temple that was lame from birth. His ankle bones had been strengthened and made whole when he was recreated in Jesus' resurrection. But those ankle bones could never be strengthened and actualized in this present physical world until Peter took him by the hand and raised him up. In other words, unless you act on the basis of the reality, the reality will never be made real in you. So are you willing to live with only God's approval? That means stop those furtive little glances at your friends' faces to see signs of approval in their eyes. Do you see that? See, it means you stop. You stop acting on the basis that you need your friends' approval. You stop that. You just stop doing it. I think some of us feel it'll work the other way. We feel we'll get the sweet, fresh breath without acting. No. Part of faith is belief, but the other part of faith is action on the basis of that belief. So you have to act first. Only then does God believe that you're serious, and only then is he able to make real the miracle that he worked in Jesus in your life. It's the same with the money. You see. So many of us think, well, I am willing to depend on God for as little money as he wants me to have or as much money as he wants me to have. And we see that the bank balance is going down and a thought comes into our mind that says, oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And so many of us are waiting, Lord, Lord, drive this thought out of my mind. Drive the worry out of my mind. And God is saying, oh, no, if you believe that I will supply everything, you cast that thought out yourself. You can. You can reject the thought. You can either follow that worry right down the lane, right down to the end of depression, or you can stop thinking this very moment because you believe that the reality is that I will supply all your needs. But, loved ones, you have to act. Do you see that? It's the same with the whole sex business, the whole boy-girl relationship thing. If you are willing to live in the reality that God will choose your partner for you, then you must act on the basis of that. And you must act in this sure faith that he has chosen that partner and that you don't need to look around for one. And so immediately you stop looking out to see where that person is. Immediately you're freed from that enslaving and undignified process of always looking out for the person who's supposed to live with you forever. So, loved ones, do you see the key? 
that the reality is that all of us in this room have been recreated in Jesus with personalities like him that are able to trust our Father for all the money and friends that we need. That's reality. You have to decide, are you willing to live in that reality and then live in that reality? That's the exciting part of faith. I think a lot of you miss it, you know. But it is exciting to move out and act, actually act on the basis of what God has said. It's exciting. And then God himself acts. In other words, the maker has done his bit. Now the next move is yours. But the maker has done what he had to do. And the reality is all there. But now you have to make your move. But so often we're saying, no, no, Lord, you make your move again. And God says, no, I have done all that is needed to change you and enable you to trust me and love me and relax in me forever. It's you that has to move into that reality. And if you do it, you'll see that all that I said has actually been done. And you'll experience a freedom and a liberty. Just one last thing, loved ones. If you find difficulty in the acting part, you know, the bit of, of acting on the basis of that reality, if you find difficulty with that, believe me, it's probably because you haven't really settled the first step, the willingness, you see. In other words, if you have trouble with a real sense of jealousy when somebody is praised over you, it's probably because you haven't really settled whether you're willing to have only God's approval on your life or not. In other words, you're not really settled in your willingness to be crucified and raised with Jesus and to enjoy only what he enjoys. Probably you'll find that. You know. The difficulty with most of us is not usually the faith thing or the, in the sense of belief. The difficulty is usually the willingness the willingness to live that way. Now, you have to decide, you know, because it's, it's really enjoyable to be together here Sunday by Sunday, and you can see the effects that that reality that God has wrought for us brings into our lives, but it's another thing completely to live in it. And you, you know, sooner or later, have to decide, am I willing to live in this reality? And then live in it. Otherwise, eventually, of course, you become a hypocrite, and eventually you contribute to the unreality of us as a body of Christ. And eventually we become just a byword among people. So it is important for you to decide, am I going to listen to this stuff forever? Or am I going to be willing to live in this reality and then live in it? And oh, I tell you, it is exciting, honestly. It really is. It's a great way to live. But the reality will only be made real if you're willing to live in the reality and then if you start living in it, then it'll be made real in you. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for such a clear word. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and if you confess him with your lips, then you will be saved. Thank you, Lord, that we've only to be willing to believe that we were recreated in Jesus and we have to be willing to live in that and then we've simply to go out of here this morning and act that way and then the whole reality of it will burst upon us and we'll find our hearts filled with your love and filled with a new peace and a new power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that your word is always sure. If you confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. Thank you that we can all do that if we choose this day. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and throughout this coming week. Amen.